At its height in the 13th century, the Mongol Empire was the largest contiguous land empire in history. It stretched from the Sea of Japan all the way into Eastern Europe, including most of continental Asia and the Middle East. Genghis Khan, his sons, grandsons, and trusted generals were rampaging across the continent with a fine-tuned military machine that was as brutal as it was brilliant. By 1223, they had their sights set on Kievan Rus, a loose federation of Eastern European states that hadn't yet become Russia. Over the next 250 years, death would literally rain down. In the aftermath, the Mongol Empire was dead and Russia was born. Welcome back to Nutty History. Today, we're exploring why you wouldn't stand a chance in Mongol Russia. Viewer discretion is advised for this video, as some of this video may be offensive or disturbing. We, the makers of this video, in no way support or condone the actions of the subjects featured. Let's start with one of the world's first known examples of biological warfare. By the end of the 13th century, after just 100 years of conquest, the Mongol Empire was falling apart. When Genghis Khan died in 1227, the Mongol Empire continued to expand, under the leadership of his sons and grandsons, particularly Batu Khan, who marched towards Europe, and Kublai Khan, who ended up conquering most of China and establishing the Yuan Dynasty. Infighting and rivalries would soon take their toll, however. A series of civil wars led to the fracturing of the empire into four khanates, which were basically the Mongol version of kingdoms. The Eastern Khanate was the Golden Horde, which controlled the Crimean Peninsula and the lands north, towards what is modern-day Russia. In 1266, the Mongols became friendly with the Genoese and let them have the city of Kaffa, a strategic trading post that sat on the southern coast of Crimea and gave the Genoese valuable access to the Black Sea. But by 1346, Janabek Khan was ruling a golden horde that was now Muslim, and he didn't like that the Genoese were trading Muslim slaves in the Mamluk slave trade. So Janabek besieged the city of Kaffa, hoping to send them back to Italy. But then, the Black Plague arrived. Fleas carrying the deadly disease hopped in the fur of rats, and the rats hopped on ships and caravans traveling from Asia to Europe, spreading death along the way. The fleas and rats made their way to the Mongols as they were laying siege to Kaffa. Jadabek's men began dying by the hundreds. It got so bad that the Mongols began using their siege catapults to hurl the dead, decaying bodies of their comrades over the walls of Kaffa. For days and days, the rotting corpses piled up within the city. Those behind the walls could only cover their mouths and noses to mask the stench. Twelve years later, a Genoese lawyer named Gabriel de Musi wrote in grisly detail about the horror that unfolded. The dying, Mongols, stunned and stupefied by the immensity of the disaster brought about by the disease and realizing that they had no hope of escape, lost interest in the siege. But they ordered corpses to be placed in catapults and lobbed into the city in the hope that the intolerable stench would kill everyone inside. What seemed like mountains of dead were thrown into the city and the Christians could not hide or flee or escape from them, although they dumped as many bodies as they could into the sea. As soon as the rotting corpses tainted the air and poisoned the water supply, and the stench was so overwhelming that hardly one in several thousand was in a position to flee the remains of the Mongol army. This gruesome scene is how the Black Plague spread to Europe, although it's up for debate whether the catapulted plague corpses were able to actually transmit the disease or whether flea-ridden rats had managed to sneak through the walls of Kaffa and do the job themselves. Either way, both Kaffa and the Mongol horde were decimated. The Black Death would rampage through Mongol and the European territory alike, leaving heaps of death in its wake. Estimates for the worldwide death toll of the worst worldwide outbreak in recorded history top out at nearly 200 million. The Mongols were skilled warriors, disease would kill more people than they ever could. With their empire already tearing at the seams, the plague quickly made a bad situation worse. The Mongols were heading towards a full-on collapse. But let's rewind a hundred years and travel to the time of peak Mongol muscle flexing. You wouldn't want to be living in Kievan Rus during the Mongol invasion of the region. As we know by now, the safety of a fortified wall can often be an illusion. Between 1237 and 1242, the Mongols destroyed cities across modern-day Ukraine and western Russia, 
using catapults and siege engines to tear through enemy gates. Anyone who didn't immediately surrender was slaughtered. Entire cities were burned to the ground. Not even women, children, or the elderly were exempt from Mongol wrath. The full-scale invasion began in 1237, when Genghis Khan's grandson, Batu Khan, led his forces into Kievan Rus. Batu Khan commanded an imposing army of 35,000 archers on horseback, and they had their way with the disorganized principalities of the Rus. At this point, the city of Vladimir was one of the main capitals of Kievan Rus. Although again, Kievan Rus was a loose collection of separate states, many of which did not get along too well. In November of 1237, Batu Khan told Prince Yuri II of Vladimir that he should surrender before things got too bloody. He didn't, so things did get bloody. The Mongols besieged the city of Ryazan first. The Prince of Ryazan, also named Yuri, appealed to Yuri of Vladimir to help him out, but his appeal was ignored. In just a few days, Ryazan was sacked. The Mongols slaughtered the entire population and burned the city to the ground. It was never rebuilt. Then the Mongols besieged Vladimir and burnt it to the ground. Again, no one was spared. Yuri II and his entire royal family were killed. Batu Khan and his generals then split into smaller units and lay waste to 14 more cities in the region before focusing on Kiev, the most important city in the region at the time. The Mongols really wanted to avoid burning Kiev to the ground like the rest of the Rus cities that lay smoldering in their wake. Kiev was a spectacular city by medieval standards. It was the namesake of the Kievan Rus Federation, one of the oldest uninhabited cities in the region, and a cultural and economic hub. It wouldn't be for long, though. Batu Khan sent envoys to Kiev to tell its Grand Prince, Michael of Chernigov, that he should submit to Mongol rule. Instead of submitting, Michael killed the envoys. In 1240, the siege was on. The Mongol siege tech made quick work of Kiev's fortifications, and Batu's army massacred nearly the entire population. Of the 50,000 inhabitants of Kiev, just 2,000 were alive when it was all finished. Of the 40 major buildings constructed in the city, just six were left standing. It would take centuries for Kiev to recover. Kievan Rus was no more, and what remained were beholden to their Mongol overseers. They would remain vassal states for the next 200 plus years. The onslaught of Kievan Rus really began in 1223 when two of Genghis Khan's most decorated generals, Jeeb and Subyute, led their armies in what's now the Donetsk Oblast region of Ukraine. There, the Mongols pummeled the Rus army in the Battle of the Kalka River. If you were a regular fighter in the Rus army, it was likely you were killed in battle. The Mongols annihilated nearly everyone. However, if you were a noble or high-ranking Rus military leader, it was likely you died in a much more painful way. In traditional Mongol fashion, Kievan nobles and their leader, Mstislav of Kiev, were killed without bloodshed. Instead, they were stacked beneath a Mongol victory platform and slowly suffocated to death, while the Mongol generals celebrated by feasting atop their dying bodies. It was a similarly slow death for the Federation of Kievan Rus. As quickly as the Mongols arrived and decimated the Rus army at Kalkin, they left. They would go no further than Kalka. It was more of a renaissance mission, with some light pillaging and bloody battles along the way. Instead of pushing further into Eastern Europe, the Mongols withdrew back to Asia to meet up with their leader, Genghis Khan. The Battle of Kalka left the Rus Federation in tatters, and the region would be ripe for the picking when Batu Khan brought his forces there 15 years later. Although they had frighteningly superior armies, there were not many of them. For the Mongols, skill and strategy beat sheer numbers every time. Their ability to organize tens of thousands of men on horseback while at the same time firing arrows with pinpoint accuracy was reason enough for their easy romp across Asia and Eastern Europe. It was like synchronized swimming, but with horses and pools of blood. Tack onto that the use of terror tactics like biological black plague catapult warfare, and you have yourself a recipe for world domination. In addition to harnessing the deadliest worldwide outbreak in human history to torment their enemies, the Mongols also enjoyed long walks on the beach, burning farmland to induce famine. 
wiping cultures clean of their history by destroying their books and decimating entire populations. Over time, though, this terror strategy became a propaganda strategy. The Mongols were clever. They knew that perception was the key to the game. Destroying city after city and leaving nothing behind would leave your kingdom an empty shell with no economic value. It was better to leave cities intact but subservient, bent but not broken. A broken city couldn't pay tribute, so the Mongols used their reputation to their advantage. Their surrender or die war cry directed at the cities in their crosshairs became one of the best bluffs in military history. Facing armies far larger than their own, the Mongols were able to storm two continents, in many cases simply by puffing out their chest and letting the past do the talking. But the past could become the future very quickly if you met the Mongols and you didn't fall in line. True to form, the Mongols slaughtered Orthodox Christians in Kievan Rus without mercy before relenting and allowing Christianity to spread throughout the region. Initially, it was an extermination. Helpless churches and monasteries were torched after their treasuries were looted. Priests were killed, and their god was humiliated. Eventually, though, the Mongols came to respect the Russian Orthodox faith. Many Mongols were, in fact, Christian. However, they practiced Nestorian Christianity, a version that split off early on in the evolution of the religion. Differing views on the divinity of Jesus led most Europeans, including the Crusaders, to consider Nestorianism heretical. All the same, the Mongols would relate somewhat to their defeated vassal states in the Rus. After the Mongols tore through Kievan Rus, they maintained their strangled hold for a while by using divide and conquer tactics similar to people bending the truth or exaggerating information on social media. The Mongols were master manipulators. They were able to incite hatred and war amongst the fragmented states of Kievan Rus through feigned alliances and House of Cards style backdoor dealings that would make even the most seasoned veteran of Capitol Hill blush. As a result, the region remained split, at war with themselves, while also paying taxes to the few men from Mongolia who managed to bring them to their knees. Eventually, the Rus leaders learned to use this same tactic against their Mongol overlords. A game of political cat and mouse ensued where various Rus leaders would ally with the Mongols against other Rus leaders in the hopes of gaining more territory. It worked. The Rus also learned from the Mongols' administrative finesse. The Rus territory slowly but surely congealed into a powerful state, unified at last by Ivan the Great, who declared himself the ruler of all Rus in 1503. It wasn't all fun and games for the Mongols, though. If you were in the Mongol military, there's a good chance you'd be killed by the cold before a sword or arrow ever came near you. Russia and Eastern Europe are notoriously difficult places to wage sustained warfare in. Just ask Napoleon and Hitler, whose armies were defeated as much by harsh winters and starvation as by the Russian military. The same thing happened to the Mongol hordes over the course of their conquests in the region. Before they got to the Kalka River and dined atop suffocating Rus nobility, Batu Khan and his army had to weather a harsh winter in the Kakuzas, where Batu lost hundreds of men to the frigid cold and had to abandon a lot of their siege equipment. It's difficult to lug heavy battering ramps through snowy mountains while starving and frostbitten. Part of the reason the Mongols were able to advance into Rus territory was because Earth's climate gave them some advantageous conditions. When the medieval warning period ended around the beginning of the 14th century, the Gobi Desert in Central Asia was transformed from a harsh, dry, unforgiving landscape into a wetter one, as glaciers melted and pooled into lush oases scattered across Central Asia. These watering holes helped sustain the Silk Road and allowed the Mongols to push eastward from their homeland on the plains of Mongolia towards Europe, but it also led to their downfall. As the Mongols stormed through Kievan Rus, it seemed like they were destined to take all of Europe. Their military strategy was medieval high-tech, their propaganda machine was purring, and their ruthless reputation preceded them wherever they went. Entire kingdoms were kneeling before them. After Kiev was sacked in 1240, the Mongols turned east towards Hungary. 
By 1241, they had forced the Hungarian king, Bela IV, into exile and had killed an estimated one million Hungarians. The Mongols were all set to move into Hungary and begin their campaign towards the mighty Holy Roman Empire. But then they turned around and headed back through their newly conquered lands in Kievan Rus. It seems like the same wet conditions that allowed the Mongols to move east from the Mongolian steppe and transform from humble nomadic herders into a continent-spanning empire were also the same conditions that led to their downfall on the western edges of their territory. Successive years of rainy weather between 1238 and 1241 turned the normally dry Hungarian plains into marshland. The Mongol armies were bogged down. Their horses and siege weaponry couldn't navigate this new terrain. The wet weather also ruined harvest and crop failure led to food shortages which led to famine and the death of thousands of Mongol soldiers as they were preparing to move west through Hungary. By 1490, the vast Mongol Empire was a shell of itself. The Golden Horde, the dynasty established by Batu Khan, that once controlled a vast area from Central Asia and the Kukuzas into Western Rus territories was no more. A united Russia had emerged under Ivan the Great in 1480, and the Mongols were scattered to the wind, susceptible to the harsh winters and plagued by famine. Sheikh Ahmed, the last Mongol Khan of the now feeble Golden Horde, inherited a mess from his father, Ahmed Khan bin Kuchek, to shore up his dwindling empire Sheikh Ahmed tried to ally with the Kingdom of Lithuania to stave off the growing might of Ivan the Great, but the alliance failed. To make matters worse, Ivan and his growing Russian Empire had allied with Ahmed's rival Khan down in Crimea, Mingli Gidi. Together they decimated Sheikh Ahmed's forces, but not through direct warfare. They burned farmland, which led to famine. Successive winters throughout the 1490s killed thousands of livestock. With no food and no hope left, most of Sheikh Ahmed's men either died or defected. The end of the Mongol reign in the Rus was complete. So, do you think you would survive life in Mongol Russia? If so, comment below. Thank you for watching Nutty History, and don't forget to smash that like button.